Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Palomita webinar, Recent Open Source Legal Issues, Ameriprise, Fantech, and more. My name is Jeff Lush. I'm the founder of Palomita. I'm also our CTO. I see that there are people joining us in the lobby here, so we're just going to give them about five more seconds here to welcome in, and then we'll start the presentation. Thanks again. This is Jeff Lush, the founder and CTO of Palomita, and I'm here today to talk about recent open source legal issues, Ameriprise, Fantech, and, and one or two more. This webinar will take about an hour. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. And if you do have any questions, please type them in the right-hand side. There's a chat box in the GoToWebinar client. And at the end of the seminar, we will look and ask and answer some of the questions that we see there. The slides and recording will also be available afterward on the Palomita website. Today we're going to go over a few recent open source court cases of note. Uh, the first one we'll go over is one regarding a company called Fantech. The next one is a recent lawsuit between Versata Ameriprise, and Zimpleware. And lastly, a, uh, a lawsuit involving the U.S. Postal Service, Corvus, and a person named Robert Davidson. And at the end, we'll have a few takeaways uh, for each of these cases that you may find helpful. And then, at, as always, we'll have some time for question and answering at the end. This slide is always in every presentation about open source legal issues. So I will have it myself. Uh, first, I need to say is I am not a lawyer. Uh, I am just a technical person who lives in the, the world of licensing. And so one of my jobs here is to try to take some of the information that we see in the press and in the courts and try to digest it and make it so that uh, lawyers and engineers and engineering managers can kind of have a takeaway. I'm also, if I'm not a lawyer in the first place, I'm definitely not your lawyer. So do not take any of this as legal advice. Um, this is mostly observations that I've seen uh, in these recent cases. But also not your programmer. Uh, you should be speaking both with your lawyers as well as your programmers and technical staff about all of these issues. Education and communication is extremely important. And I think we'll see today uh, how, how some of the issues around education and communication actually cause problems for these organizations. So the purpose of today's talk is really to go at a high level, talk about some of these, these, these court cases. Um, I go around the world, I talk to lawyers, you know, some of the most famous in the world, others who, who uh, are, are not in the news but are doing some really amazing open source legal work. I talk to uh, vice president of engineering, founders, CTOs, line level developers all around the world. And I'm still amazed sometimes in 2015, things that, that many of us have been reading about for years still have not bubbled up, I think, to the consciousness of, of maybe the line level IP council or even for some of the largest custom companies in the world, I've seen some cases where when I bring up these issues, somebody says, you know, I'm not really familiar with that. Can we talk about that a little bit? And that, that's the purpose of today's talk, is uh, in, in some, some quick hits, some shorthand, talk about the basic issues of these court cases. There's a lot of great discussion um, in, in, in longer form uh, writing on the web uh, for each of these cases, and I, I highly recommend you take a look after today's webinar and seminar to dive deeper into those. But what I tried to crystallize today is the basics and why we think this is an issue, what the case is about, and then some takeaways that, that you may be able to come back to your organization with it's to basically help educate other lawyers, other engineers, CEOs on down. Um, it is always amazing when I go to a place and I say, who here has heard about this case or that case? We may have 20, 30, 40, 50 people together and in some cases, there will only be one or two hands raised, and these are IP lawyers and, and, and uh, engineering, engineering leads at very major organizations. So um, I think there's still a lot of education to be done, especially about these cases. But I also take this as a bit of a, a tip of the iceberg, that if, if, if uh, these people and those people are not hearing about these cases, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of uh, making people understand the issues here. So the first issue that we'd like to talk about, the first case, is, is a, I think a relatively famous case 
that occurred over in Germany, and it involved a, co a company called Fantech. And if you're not familiar with Fantech, they make hardware devices, or one of the things that they do is they make hardware devices for playing video and multimedia on your television set. So say you have a, 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 a bunch of movies and audio and songs and podcasts and things like that that you want to put on your large, large screen TV. They sell devices that, that allow you to do that very, very quickly and very simply, and um, they're very popular devices. Um, as, as most large organizations who are doing complicated, interesting things, they depended on a lot of outside vendors to help them create these devices that they sell. It, it's very hard these days to live in a vacuum and be a sole proprietor and build all the source code, all the hardware, all the materials by yourself. So they, like, like everyone else in the world, has, have a, a large and long supply chain involving hardware, software, plastics, wires, you can, you can imagine it especially in the software space. And their product lives on top of a full embedded computer running a Linux operating system. Uh, my general rule is if you, if you see some sort of device that's out there that does something interesting, and even if it doesn't look like a, a, a traditional computer or laptop to you, if it has a wireless card in it, if it has Wi-Fi, if, if it has an Ethernet port on the back, if maybe even if it has a USB port on the back, these are all signs that there is likely an embedded computer in it, quite possibly running a Linux operating system. So tr traditionally in the past, we would look at these embedded devices and you know, anything that's small and has plastic around it and maybe no screen and think, well, maybe this is hand-wired, ha hand-coded, uh, small embedded source code. Not a large operating system, not a lot of content there. Well, chips have gotten so fast uh, they've gotten so small, memory has gotten so cheap, that it's very easy to take basically a full computer, full motherboard, shrink it down to the size of something that'll fit in, in basically something the size of your phone or even smaller, that can run a full Linux stack with hundreds, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of third-party modules, applications, utilities, libraries running inside of it but all hidden inside a device that has no screen, has no classic uh, interface that we would expect. But it is a full operating system with all the GPL version 2 content and more that you would expect to see in Linux. Well, back in May of 2012, the Free Software Foundation Europe ran a really interesting seminar conference called Hacking for Compliance. And basically, as I understand it, is they went out and they went to the local electronics store and somehow picked up a few devices. And one of them was the Fantech uh, 3D FHDL video player, which basically is something like the size of a, a, a book on your bookshelf that has a power cord, Ethernet cord, maybe some wireless in it, uh, HDMI output, I believe. Basically, something that you can put music, videos, content on it and play on, play on your TV. And, and using the kind of that rule of thumb, which is if it's got an output of maybe a video output or a monitor output, if it has an Ethernet cord on it or if it has wireless on it, well, there's a good, good chance that this is running the Linux operating system deep inside of it. And I think that the Free Software Foundation Europe looked at this and said, hey, let's, let's go take a look and see what's going on inside of this, this, this device. And what, what they found is they found that they were using a particular called a library or service called IP tables, which is, which is basically firewall related. It helps keep the device secure. It is licensed under the general public license. And the expectation there is that all GPL code is, is that you let people know that you're using it, that, that if somebody uh, uh, wants the source code, if you do a distribution, well, that they are allowed to have that source code for, for those materials. That is, that is the way the GPL works. It's, it's not very controversial. Uh, it's people are doing a lot of great programming, you know, out of the goodness of their hearts, and, and, and they should be rewarded, and they should, the credit should be given to where credit's due. Well, the Fantech was found to be using this, this service called IP Tables, and when, when the person who is the, the main copyright holder there, Harold Walty, who, who wrote IP Tables, he also is behind the organization called GPLViolations.org, well, he, he wanted Fantech to deliver the source code, the correct source code for the version that they are compiling and distributing 
to their customers. And that is that is what the expectations are. If you're if you're getting a device and it has GPL code on it, you should be able to first off know that the code is there. The license file should exist, and you should be able to get the source code for any of the the, the compiled bits or, or materials that are sent along that are that are linked to that GPL component. And and it was really hard for whatever reason. Uh, Harold, Mr. Walty was not able to get the correct source code. And after a certain point, it became a court case. And, and I often get asked, you know, why, why don't we see a lot of court cases out there around GPL compliance, et cetera? And, and, and the standard response I have is, if you're working at an organization and a letter comes in from somebody who's a legitimate copyright owner who says, you're, you're shipping my product, my component that's licensed under this GPL, GPL2, B3, Afero, whatever the, the copyleft license is, the, the license that requires sharing a source code. If you're an organization and that letter comes in, more often than not, 90%, 99% of time, letter comes in, you talk to the engineering team, and you work on getting compliant. You, you're shipping it, you, you owe the code, especially for something like IP tables, which traditionally is not going to be seen as, as linking uh, very strongly to your core IP for many for many people. In some ways, it's kind of a hygiene issue. The code was asked for. You go find the code. You you tar it up, and either you put it on your website, or you somehow do a correct distribution to of, of the code to your to your the requester. Well, Fantech wasn't able to do that for some reason, and and the, there appears to be a claim that there was a supplier who was responsible for the compliance. There was a long long supply chain and. and when push came to shove, it just was, didn't seem to be possible to get the correct code before it became a lawsuit, before it went to the courts. And the German court, I think it was the court in Hamburg, after reviewing the facts of the case, talking to everybody, doing, doing what you do in a classic lawsuit, they decided against Fantech. And, and here's what they said. Well, actually, let me first pop, pop into one, one quick slide here, which is, well, why was this complex for Fantech what, and, and for anybody else who, who's shipping a Linux device? Well, if you look at a typical Linux operating system or a Linux stack that's going out the door for an embedded device, uh, if you start at the bottom, you start very low level, very close to the hardware, uh, something that's called the firmware. That's, that's what helps the device turn on, become a computer, do all the things that it's supposed to do, load things off the disk, show things on the screen, whatever it may be. And then it's going to boot the bootloader. The bootloader is what pulls things off the disk and turns turns the operating system on. Well, the kernel, which is the heart of the operating system, gets loaded. The kernel then starts loading more and more and more. Next thing you know, more services get turned on, applications get loaded, databases get started. And then finally, finally, at the very top, that yellow box, maybe your application gets started and starts, starts running. Well, there's a lot of content underneath your yellow box. So if you're a company who's making, say, a video player, you may have a, you might actually have a very small percentage of bits on that device. Your, your, maybe you might have a million lines of code. Maybe you might have half a million lines of code in your application. Well, all of Linux is hundreds of millions of lines of code. It is, it is a lot of material. It is a huge, huge work. And there are a lot of moving pieces there. There are databases. There are services. There are firewalls. There are command line tools. There are string search tools. There's web, web web servers, they are web browsers, all these things can get shipped on a Linux device. Very often when you're making a embedded device, you try to make it as small as possible and pare down a lot of these, these services and items, but still, just to have a general Linux device that is network aware, that has security aware, there's, there's going to be a lot of content there. And IP tables lives kind of in the middle of this stack somewhere between the, the drivers, the kernel, the system libraries and frameworks, there's pieces of it all, all over the place there. But it's, it's kind of low level. Um, if you didn't know, if you, if you just were a developer and you're running on top of a Linux device, you might not even know that IP tables exist. Uh, you are creating your, your user interface, you're dealing with uh, throwing video around and logins and things like that. You may not even know that your device is running on, on uh, an operating system that has a firewall at all very low level, it's below the fold, as they might say. Well, that doesn't mean you can ignore it. And, and, and what has happened for many organizations who are shipping embedded devices is they kind of they pay attention a lot to the yellow box. They, they, they look at what they're shipping. Or maybe they, 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 
they look maybe at some of the system libraries and frameworks that they've added. You know, very often you might see somebody list the RPMs, which is a series of what's called libraries that maybe the development team added to their core Linux operating system. But you, you don't see a lot of uh, compliance and disclosures around the core OS that come in. And, 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 and more and more people are looking at that and saying, well, there's a lot of open source code that should be giving credit that's not getting credit. IP tables was definitely one of those. It, it lived kind of in the middle there. So what did the court say? So after reviewing what, what the com company said, what Harold Wolfe said, what experts said, the lawyers said, looking at things like that stack, looking at the GPL license, looking at what was done with the device, what they basically said, what the court said, is releasing good enough code was not sufficient. So if you are shipping, I think this was version 1.3.7 of IP tables, if that's what you're shipping and you, 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 you've modified it even, or you've, you've downloaded it at a different date, your, the people who request the source code, people who distributed, distributed this device to, they should get the exact bit-for-bit -bit version of that library source code that you used. Kind of what the GPL license says, kind of what the expectations in the community are, and you can't say give them version 1.36 when you're actually shipping 1.37. Or if you've added bug fixes, or if you've added modules to that library, to that component, you just can't give away, say, the stock source code that you downloaded independently. You need to give away the exact source that you're shipping. And, and that was, for whatever reason, that was tough for Fantech to do, um, maybe because of the length of the supply chain, maybe just because of the, the length of time between when it was produced and the request. But for whatever reason, they weren't able to do that right away. Court said, you need, to, you need to save that source code. You need to be able to comply with that distribution requirement pretty much um, when asked, there's some rules in the GPL3 about how many years that needs to be, but this was still in that, that time frame. And, and one of the main things, too, is that the company was responsible for what they shipped, even if it was written by an outside supplier. And in, and in some ways, I, you know, I, don't, I don't think that's a surprise. If, if something's going out the door and there's, there's, there's content in it, you are responsible for it. Uh, you are doing the distribution. Yeah. I think some people were trying to wait and see what, what, was, what was the court going to see about, say about this issue here. But when, when they came down, and again, this is a German court, they said you are responsible for what goes out the door. The analogy I often use with developers and lawyers that I talk to is much like if you're producing a pharmaceutical. If you are shipping a pill that's going out, going out the door, and you may have a long supply chain. Maybe there's a coating. Maybe there's colors. Maybe there's flavors. There's active ingredients. There's inactive ingredients. If you had a problem with any one of those suppliers, maybe they gave you sugar instead of saccharin, or maybe they gave you a different, a band color, or whatever it may be, if it's going out your door, if you're making that pill and you're shipping it, people are going to look at you as the distributor. You, you, may, you may have some sort of relief upstream by suing your supplier or doing something like that, but there is an expectation of compliance on your side, testing, quality control setting proper standards for suppliers, things like that. Uh, it's not quite the same between the pharmaceutical world and the software world because there's things like the FDA and equivalents around the world, but, but I find that this is a, a good analogy to use with developers and, and, and some of the, the executive staff about what the expectations are, why do we have to do it, and why it's not a surprise in some ways that, that we need to do this sort of compliance when we ship a device or a product. Uh, another thing that they said, the company was responsible to confirm the accuracy of the supplier's assurances. So again, that goes back to the, if you're shipping something, you're responsible for it. You need to make sure that your supplier understands what the, your requests to them are going to be. It is much better to do this sooner rather than later. It's a lot harder to claw back or somehow figure out source code a year or two years and almost three years later uh, from a supplier, especially if there's a country barrier if there's a language barrier, maybe if there's been a problem with the supplier since then and you've gone someplace else, it's very common that people pick somebody to write something and then move on after a certain point. Well, these are all things that make it very hard to come into compliance after the fact. Also, a, a supplier might not work with you uh, if they're going to be the, 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 the cheap supplier. They're going to be the low-cost supplier if they know that you're going to have some, some obligation requirements and compliance requirements on them. It's good to know that sooner rather than later, because you are going to have to comply with a lot of these licenses uh, 
And if, if your supplier is doing this heavy lifting for you, you have to have the assurances that they're doing the right thing. And then when all said and done, they're, they're also responsible for a penalty fee plus some legal costs, as well as making sure that the code, code went out the door. So I, I, I find Fantech a really interesting case. Um, in, in some ways, I don't think it was a surprise. You know, the company was apparently shipping GPL code. They weren't providing the right source code. So the copyright holder asked for compliance. Compliance was not able to be given. It went to the courts. The courts looked at the licenses. They looked at the, 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 the kind of the specifics of the case and said, we're going to find for the person who owns the copyright here, the GPL2, the GPL is, is enforceable, and here's what we expect to happen. And the rest of these issues then fell, fell out from that. So I, I find Fantech is a really good case if you're talking with your legal team or your engineering team to say, why are we doing any sort of compliance? Why are we tracking our use of open source? Why are we making people uh, have, say, policies around certain licenses? Uh, why, why do we do checking? Why do we, do, why do we have something in our contract about uh, assurances and disclosure with our suppliers? It, it's sometimes nice to point to a case, and I find that Fantech is a really good case to point to, to basically say, here's what we thought, here's what the court said, and here's what happened. And it's pretty cut and dry. So Fantech is a good, a good case, and I, and I really recommend uh, taking a look at some of the commentary that's out there if you want a deeper view of the case. I, I found this was a really good case. Uh, the German courts have been seen as doing a lot of really interesting things around GPL compliance, and there was just some really great commentary about that, and you could spend hours, if not days, diving into it. And if you do speak German, the, 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 the judgment, the discussion uh, from the court is, is hosted as well, and uh, I hear it's an interesting read. So that, that is Fantech. The next interesting case here that I'd like to talk about is, is a little more complicated. I, I think Fantech was fairly cut and dry. That was kind of a classic GPL concern, compliance with source code distribution, very, very cut and dry. Versus the next case I'd like to talk about today is a lot more complicated. This, this is a case that's currently in the courts right now, and, and it's between basically three companies, actually more, but the three main players. There's a company called Versada, a company called Ameriprise, and then lastly a company called Zimpleware. And, and kind of long story short, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gloss over a lot of the details here to try to really get to the, the heart of the matter here, but again, there's some really great commentary out there about this case right now, and, it, and it's ongoing, and you can, you can um, definitely spend days digging into the, the discussion on this point. But long and short of it is, Versada created some financial software uh, that they sold to Ameriprise. And Ameriprise passed that out to contractors, passed that code on to, on to customers, as expected. Everything was, was hunky-dory for many, many years. This, this worked well for everyone. Uh, and then there was a falling out between Versada and Ameriprise over contract terms. You know, happens in the, in the business world, you can, you can have a partner for many years, and then at a certain point the partner wants to do one thing, you want to do a different thing, uh, you look at your contract, you, you think that you're allowed to do one thing, they're not allowed to do another thing. Very, very classic business law case. Well, uh, Ameriprise wanted to do something that, that Versada didn't want them to do and vice versa, and they basically ended up where Versada sued Ameriprise for breach of contract. And they felt that the, the the business terms had broken down, and so that Versada was now going to sue Ameriprise over this breach of contract. Well, while they're being sued, Ameriprise did some research to defend themselves, which is something, again, you should just expect. If, 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 if someone sues you, you're going to put up a defense. You're going to look to see what you can do, and you're going to see what can stick. And Ameriprise did that, and they looked, and they, they discovered that the, the software that they had been sold or licensed from Versada they had an apparent GPL violation. So they, they looked inside the, the application that, that they were using that was, that was built by Versada, and they found out that, that, that there was a, a library in there that was licensed under the terms of the GPL, and they, they did not have the source code for it. They, they, they said, let's, let's, see if we can, let's see if we can countersue, and they countersued now, again, for breach of contract. So suit and countersuit. Very typical in the business world, but what was very interesting about this is that the countersuit was regarding and basically an apparent open source license violation. Okay. 
And a little background. So Versata had created their product, and they needed basically something that's a parse XML. So if you're not familiar with this, uh, there's a way of basically storing data in text format, and this format is called XML. And uh, if, if you're a lawyer and you haven't played around with it, anytime you open up something, it looks a little bit like a web page, a little bit like HTML code. A bunch of text, a bunch of tags, very common. Pretty much almost every, every application that's out there right now is using these XML files for holding configuration or storing data or, or settings and things like that. So Versada needed, the developers at Versada needed a library for parsing XML. And they went out, apparently on the internet, and found this library called VTD-XML, which is created by a company called Zimpleware, which is dual licensed. Uh, it's available either under the terms of the GPL or, alternatively, a commercial license if, if you get under contract and, and pay, pay money for it. This is very a very common licensing scheme that's out there. Um, if you're familiar with other other components or programs, MySQL, for example, has a licensing scheme like this, where it's either GPL or commercial. Um, many, many, many other uh, components that are like that as well. It's just it's just a business model for some what you would call open source companies or open core companies. Well, apparently, Versata did not purchase a commercial license for this library. Therefore, we're assumed to be using this library under the default terms of the GPL. And just the way that when looking at the product, that the feeling was that uh, this was perhaps a GPL violation. And it was linked in such a way that perhaps all the source code would be under the terms of the GPL if, if people followed it out to a conclusion. And so at this, so suit, counter suit. And then at this point, Zimpleware, which was the original manufacturer, creator of that open source library, found out, and then sued Versada, Ameriprise, and other partners and customers of Ameriprise on two different types of grounds. One was a copyright ground, and the other one was a patent ground. Basically, they, um, Zimpleware had some patents around technologies and techniques that were being used inside of this library. So that's how they, 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 they felt that they had a, a patent case. And then there was just a classic case of if you're using somebody else's library that's licensed under certain terms, if you're not following those terms, that's potentially a copyright case, a copyright suit. Um, it is still in the courts right now, though recently, I think it was in the last November or so, there's been some decisions and movement on this. But, but it's a very, very complicated and interesting case. Um, I, think, I think we're going to see a lot more about this over the next few months. And uh, basically, it, it kind of shows the importance of knowing what you're, knowing what you're building, knowing what you're getting from your partners, and, and just being able to uh, you know, be able to respond if something comes in. So we'll have some takeaways at the, at the end of the session as well, but I, I, I do think this is one, one of the more interesting cases that happened in the last couple of years around open source. Because this is not a, a, a classic case of, say, a community member or an open source organization um, coming to a large commercial organization and saying you're using my code incorrectly, or I, I'd like credit and you're not giving me credit. I think you know you guys have a lot of money. You should be doing the right thing here. Um, this was this was a very complicated business to business lawsuit. That one of the defenses was you gave us code that you didn't have rights to give to give to us. Um, you gave us a open source problem, which then was passed on to our customers or suppliers and partners. Um, and it was used as it's called a weapon to, to, to fight back against the suit. So very interesting. It was the first time I've seen that happen um, in many years, if, if, if ever. And it also just shows the importance of the software supply chain um, and education. So uh, Versada's developers sound like maybe didn't quite understand the licensing of the library that they selected. Um, when they went out, they had many, 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 many choices for XML parsing. You know, if you go out to SourceForge or GitHub or just regular internet search and say XML parsing library for Java, you can click page after page after page after page of, of uh, choices. Some are tiny, some are huge, some are cheap, some are, are commercial, some are open source under pretty much any license under the rainbow. And to end up with a GPL licensed version 
kind of maybe shows that the developer maybe did not understand the licensing, or, or maybe that they did but it didn't get passed up the chain. I don't know, but it, it, it is a very, this is a very common thing that we see when we, when we go look at companies' code, we get asked to, to do our review. We typically find that organizations are only aware of about 10% of the open source and third-party code that they're using. So in the 90% of the things that they're not tracking, that they don't know about, there is a spectrum of licenses, commercial, GPL, some of FARO, a lot of um, unknown licenses a lot of okay licenses well, you know, or you know, very, you know, very simple to comply with like attribution licenses like the BSD and the MIT, etc. But 90% of it is unknown. And any one of those libraries could be a case much like this. If you don't know what you're shipping, you don't know what you're giving to your customers. And this, this is a particular, particular, I think, hot topic these days, especially uh, the more time that goes on, the more libraries that we're seeing you know, a, a, a large open source payload five years ago would have been something like 50 to 150 open source libraries. A large payload in 2015 can be 1,000 or 2,000 open source libraries, most of which are unknown from the, from the original engineering team. And the last case before we get into the, the, the quick, hits, uh, quick hits on this here is Another interesting case that I, that I bring up, mostly for around multimedia. So a couple of years ago, the United States Postal Service wanted to make a new stamp. And the Postal Service really, really liked making Statue of Liberty stamps. There's been something like 15 or 25 Statue of Liberty stamps going back over, over the last 100 years or so. And it's just a very stamp. It's just a great, you know, everybody loves Statue of Liberty. But if, you, if you look at the, the image of this, page here, we see you know, three different shots of the Statue of Liberty, one of which is what was turned into the actual stamp itself um, at the top here in 2011. Um, there's a shot on the left, shot on the right. You go out to the internet and you type in Statue of Liberty photo and look at the images in there. You can click millions of times. There are millions of photos of the Statue of Liberty out there on the internet. And, and if you want you know, a picture, you can go out and license it. And that's what the United States Postal Service did. They went out and they licensed a photo of the Statue of Liberty to turn into a stamp, something that they've done before, uh, not controversial, very, very normal course of action. Well, the problem is there was, there was a little piece of complexity involving the photo that they selected. So the, the difference between the photo on the left-hand side and the photo on the right-hand side could be the difference between maybe $2,000 in licensing fees and maybe half a million, a million in, in, in damages for licensing. And you, know, you might say, well, what's the, what's the difference? What's the difference between these two pictures? And why, why might there be such a big difference in, in the licensing fees? Well, what, what it turns out is the photo that they selected, the image that they selected, was not the classic Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. You know, good old, good old uh, Statue of Liberty. It was actually the Statue of Liberty in the Las Vegas casino. So a different sculpture, a different location, and a different set of intellectual property laws. So after they went to the stock image site, they thought it was the Statue of Liberty in New York. They, they clicked apparently through all the right things. The, uh, the uh, um, Corbis, which is a stock image site told them things about it, they then went to go use it. Well, it turns out there's a sculptor named Robert Davidson who's responsible for creating the, 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 the different version of the statue in Las Vegas. And he owns the copyright on, on and the usage of the statue itself. So not just the photo, which is what was licensed through Corbis, but there were additional rights that were required to be, to be licensed. So not just the photo, but the content, in this case, the content of the photo, because it was a sculpture. So then Robert Davidson then sued the USPS for damages, apparently. And, and the terms have not been released, but I, I've seen other cases in the past where this has been half a million dollars, $600,000, $700,000. We don't know what, what happened in this case here, but there is a chance that it was settled for about, you know, about on the order of about a million dollars. So, so why is this important? What, what happened here? 
Well, I see this very often, and again, you know, none, none of us probably are creating stamps on the phone on the phone call today, on the webinar today. But almost all of us are going out and using multimedia images, sounds, fonts, other non-source code materials that the end up being in our product. And, and what I always say is multimedia and the user interface is the face of your brand. So when, when your customers are going out and they're starting your application or they're buying your device, what pops up first is a window, a user interface, icons, images, stock art, et cetera, buttons, all these things that is what the main way that your users interact with your product. And that's that face of your brand. It, it's what people think of when, when they think of you. You can imagine list, list famous, famous companies that are out there and think about their buttons, think about their user interface, think about the fonts that they, that they choose. That really defines one company over another. Well, one of the issues that we see is that developers are not graphic designers. So if they're asked to suddenly have buttons or a background screen, or a background image, or an animation, or a sound. Um, it, for, for most developers, this is not something that they're going to pull out the, 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 the pressure-sensitive tablet and draw a scene or create a button. They're, they're either going to go out to a graphics department, if you have one in your company, and make a request. Hey, we need 75 buttons that have this look and feel, that have um, this size, et cetera, and they get it back. Or they go to the internet, they do a quick web search, and they say, you know, um, uh, corner buttons, or green button, or a logo of this um, company, or whatever it may be. And they find this content, they then download it. Same thing with images, same thing with fonts. Somebody really wants to find a font, there's a ton of font websites out there where you type the type of font, or you click around on the fonts that you like, and you download the font. Well the, well, the problem is there's licensing involved, or it's not a problem, it's just a reality. There's licensing involved with all these resources. And some of the licensing may be very, very permissive. It may be public domain. It may be a Creative Commons zero license. But more commonly, there's, there's, there's a stronger license involved. Many times, it's a commercial license. So artwork that comes from the internet, there's a really good chance that it's going to be under commercial terms. If you go to a stock art site, almost by the very definition, there's going to be commercial terms for that stock art. You'll have great permissions, you'll have a, a, a clear chain of custody and supply chain there, but it's still commercial. And just because you license something for one use doesn't mean you can use it for another use. And developers just don't treat these resources with the same understanding as they do for source code. We see what a lot of developers do with source code, which is they grab 90% of the open source from the internet and they just use it without disclosing it. Multimedia, I would say, has an even higher percentage of undisclosed use. Uh, this is because it's maybe not seen as being the same type of issue as source code. Maybe because the legal teams have, have really maybe hammered in, hey, don't, don't just download a library without permission, but we don't talk about images and multimedia as well as much. It's very easy to grab. Search engines basically exist for typing something in, getting a photo and downloading it, or an image or a sound. And then you put it into your code base. You check it into source code management, and suddenly in your product, very often, there are no terms inside of these, these pictures, these fonts, et cetera, that show who owns them. There's no copyright label. There's no multi-piece of metadata that says, here's where I came from, or here's what my license is. The vast majority of this content, even commercially licensed content, is silent inside of the, the, the content itself about what it's licensing is. Well, the issue is it's very easy to, 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 to recognize in the field. Um, my understanding of the stamp here is that there was a stamp collector who was very familiar with all the Statue of Liberty stamps and looked at this and said, something's different, and did a little research and figured out what was going on. Um, I, I, I see cases all the time, instances where somebody is able to recognize the, the art that they created in an advertisement or, or in a product. Um, fonts are very easy to, to, to recognize. Sounds even more so. Uh, you, you, hear, you hear a certain sound in a game, you know it's come from another game. These are all things that are very easy, especially when you have a million or a hundred million or a billion users, which some of these large websites have. The, the, the odds are someone is really good at, at recognition and will recognize um, this issue. And it also has a, a tradition of being very costly to fix after the fact, um, especially for multimedia, images, sounds, etc. Uh, when, when, when something has been seen as copied or not licensed correctly, 
we're talking typically a fairly large check, a fairly large suit. Um, this seems to be the nature of the beast. And typically when I see these cases, it's a single picture, it's a single sound, it's a single um, movie that was taken, and the, the, the final cost ends up being fairly, fairly expensive. And then stock art licensing can be complex as well. Um, when, I was, when I was putting together today's presentation and I went out to some of the stock art sites, I went explicitly to go look at uh, photos of the Statue of Liberty in the Las Vegas casino to see if there was any sort of, of notice or warning or anything like that. And I, and I did not see any specific warning or notice on many of the places that I went to download um, commercially licensed photos of the, the Las Vegas casino. So I'm not sure. It's one of the action items for me to look at. I have not seen it reported anywhere. It, it's possible that there's been some sort of license agreement, but I haven't seen that reported. And I, I, I would be kind of surprised to, know, to, to see if that was the case. So it's probably still possible right now to go find yourself in the same situation with the Statue of Liberty in Las Vegas um, using these stock, stock start sites. And, and perhaps even worse, just going out to the internet and just finding a photo of, of something that you want to use, especially something like the Statue of Liberty. So the, the, the takeaway from this, again, is education, 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 as always. But also, for things that are multimedia, it's often a good idea to put an additional level of compliance around this. If, if images, sounds, other multimedia items are coming into your code base and you're paying people to do that, you have a design team or a, a outside licensed um, graphics team, it's really important to keep track of what you license, what the terms are, whether it work for hire, is it royalties based on how you're using it. I mean, if you go to these stock art sites, what you'll see is if you're making a, an, a mobile app, the costs are different than if you're making a website, which is different than if you're making a classic application, which is different than what you're doing a print ad, and so on and so on. And very often when people license this content in, they might license it for one purpose, but then once it's in the code base, it gets reused and relicensed for all sorts of different purposes that are out there. So having good tracking on the inbound, and then having good rules in place for understanding how these things can be used, will, will keep yourself out of trouble in the future. And I think we'll also um, just, just help your developers understand what are the proper licensing um, considerations that they should be keeping in mind when they're putting this together. I, I think if you have a web team, uh, so people doing JavaScript or web design for you, this is a really important conversation to have with them. Um, I've, I've seen um, from, from large companies down to individuals, and I see this on the social networks I'm on all the time, where somebody put together a, a website for personal reasons and they grab the photo from someplace and they get a, a, a letter in the mail requesting a payment. And um, kind of a surprise to them, because they didn't expect that there was going to be um, any cost for this, this multimedia that they pop, uh, pulled in, but um, very eye-opening for, for everybody involved. So lessons to be learned from these three main cases today. Um, and I, I, I like to pull this together here because very often, um, you know, uh, these, these cases can be fairly complex. I, I like, I like when, especially when I'm talking to developers, to try to distill them down and use them, maybe not as the end-all, be-all for, for around licensing and compliance, but really to help set some, some, some the, the tone and some standards that are out there. So when, when Fantech came out, uh, how we distill this down when we talk to our customers and, and people that come to me and say, what, what should I be worried about? What should I be thinking about? Well, with, with Fantech, I really distill it down to three main bullet points. Number one is, if you ship something, you're responsible for it. Again, it shouldn't be a surprise, but you know, sometimes, especially you know, us in the engineering world here, sometimes somebody really wants to say, prove it to me, show me that this is important, show me that somebody has, you know, has done this and gotten in trouble. I think Fantech is a great, a great proof point for that. It can really help uh, if you have that one person on your team who really just needs to, to, to see something written down with a court case next to it. Um, Fantech is, I think, like a great case for that. Um, there are certain components that you should always get right. If you are shipping a Linux device, um, you should, we should all be trying to do perfect compliance. We, we know that's probably a, maybe an impossible task or a very hard task. But if you're shipping a Linux device right now, and first off, you don't even know that you, you know what, what operating system you're shipping. So if you're if you're if you're on the legal team here, and you know your company is shipping some sort of electronic device that has an Ethernet plug that can go into it, 
And if you don't know what the operating system that's being shipped on that is, I would, I would, I would probably clear your afternoon schedule and start figuring out what, what operating systems are going out the door. Um, Linux, the kernel, these, these are great components. They're, they're responsible for some of the most amazing devices that are, that are being built. It's a, it's a population of you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people who are helping out with these things. Um, they, they expect a little credit where credit's due. There's strong licensing there. There's things that, there's things that should be paid attention to. The kernel, the bootloader. Um, if you're using BusyBox, which is a, a great system for providing kind of command line tools for, for small embedded devices, IP tables, IP chains, the, these, are, these are components that if you're shipping, again, that device that has a wireless card in it or has an Ethernet card in it or is you know, some sort of like mobile device, you don't know if you're shipping Linux, figure that out. If, if you are shipping Linux and you're not familiar with those five or so items that I just rounded off there, so kernel, U-boot, BusyBox, IP tables, IP chains, um, that is really something that you should start paying attention to today. Um, go talk to the team, get a little education about the, the use of Linux, where did it come from. That, that's its own webinar in the future that we'll, we'll, we'll be holding, but um, it's a great place to start, and it's, um, I think Fantech is, a, is a, a great way to start that conversation with um, with Versata, the Versata Ameriprise case, I think the, the, the main takeaway there is if you don't know what you're shipping, it can be used against you. If you are a company of a certain size, if you know that you always have business-to-business -business suits going on, and especially with customers and partners, and if you are selling them or licensing your code to them, we all know that, you know, after you've come, come to the Palomino webinars or you've worked with us before, you know that you don't know 90% of what you're shipping. Your customers don't know 90% of what they're shipping, your partners, and so on and so on. But there's a pretty big green field there in terms of finding a licensing violation or a software vulnerability or, or something that perhaps that can be used as, as a wedge or a, a carrot or a stick in a business-to-business -business lawsuit or discussion. So, uh, it's, you know, it's, again, not a surprise. If you don't know what you're shipping, it can be used against you, and it's a, it's a good place to start uh, thinking about today. And then also engineers need more education about licensing. I, my, my, my old story is, uh, you know, if we, if we talk to the, the top five or top 10% of engineers in a company, you know, these are the people who are help, helping create new open source components. They're giving great feedback on licensing. They're going to the conferences. We don't really have a lot of concern about, about those folks. It, it's more like the line level developer. You know, I, I always joke, go, go get a pizza and beer budget uh, and go, go meet the, the middle of your engineering team. You know, the people who are showing up day after day, writing lots of code, maybe not going to the conferences, but they are shouldering a lot of the weight of the design and, and, and structure of your product. And ask them some pretty pointed questions about licensing. Ask them about what does the GPL mean? What does the public domain mean? Um, what, are, we shipping, are we shipping an operating system? What, what's the license that the operating system on? I think you're going to find some really surprising responses there, a lot of folklore, a lot of misinformation as well, a lot of just like, well, I don't know. I thought it was free. Um, so, so take that away. Um, I think 2015 is definitely a year of education for a lot of people. I think 2016 will be as well. And it's something that I think we just, we can't, we can't get enough of is education, especially for each new crop of developers that come into the organization. And then lastly here, the takeaway for the, 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 the Postal Service Getty Images thing is that, that multimedia content can really have some confusing license terms. Uh, it is much more like a classic commercial license with, with a, a confusing clauses and, 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 and choice of law and this and that. Lots of, lots of things that, that a developer is just outside of their universe. Uh, sometimes they don't even know the field of use that a multimedia item is going to be used it until, you, until it actually goes out the door. So these contracts may be signed before the final usage is understood. And so understand how you're using it, where it's going to end up. Come back from time to time and just do, figure out if, if, every, if your assumptions are still accurate. And then also just know that um, people are really good at recognizing these things. So probably of, of, of the things that we talked about today, multimedia images, icons, those are probably the most likely thing for somebody to catch who's not um, in the open source world. Somebody who is maybe a musician or just a, a, you know, a, an expert or somebody who's familiar with these things. Um, and that, that, that often can have lead to some brand embarrassment. 
So we have a couple minutes here for, for questions and answers, so I do thank you for, for uh, listening to the webinar today. If you have any questions whatsoever, um, if you could um, type them into the chat, chat window on the right-hand side here. Um, and while, while people are doing that, if you also want to follow us on Twitter, we are Palomita underscore Inc. And we post new webinars and content um, from there periodically, as well as articles we find interesting. And if you have any feedback on today's topic, or if you want to suggest any future topics, please send us an email at info at palomita.com. And we, we, really, we really welcome all sorts of feedback about the, the content and future, future directions of these, these webinars. And we do appreciate everybody taking an hour out of their day today. So let's see if we have any questions. Just give me one second. Okay. I, got a, I got one question here about fonts. And the person says, you asked about fonts. Where are people getting these fonts? Well, the, the, the main place I see people getting fonts is, is they go to a search engine and they don't even really know where the font is coming from. They, they, they type in font and they, they click around or font download. And they find a few of these font, font search engines. We, we do a really good job of showing off the fonts, showing off the, the text will look like. Then, then it's a simple just click and you can download say the true type font or the OTF font, and then just start, start using it. Uh, very often these sites are going to say something like, um, please be aware these fonts have, may have third party licensing, including, and then they, they run the gamut from commercial to public domain with uh, uh, a couple font licenses and GPL and others along the way in the middle there. But it's pretty confusing. They don't make it very clear. Um, they, they often will make it sound like they're free to use or so please download this to use in your product. You may even see on some of these things. Um, and it's confusing, confusing to the developer, confusing to the artist here. Um, but mostly, mostly people, when they go get the multimedia items, they're getting it from the internet, just a standard search engine. Okay. And let's see. And um, and let's see. Stacy says she has a, a number of um, questions, and I can't see the the ones that are coming. Um, to you, Stacey, I just had the one that came to me privately. So, can you? Um, uh, sure. So, there's a few about uh, the Fantec case. Yeah. Um, how much of the judgment penalty and attorney's fees this, uh, defendants had to pay in the Fantec case? Maybe we get a copy of the slides, of course. Um, what was the basis for the judgment calculation in the Fantec case? So, I, I don't know this. Th thank you, thank you, Stacey, and thank you for the person who asked that question. I don't know the specific specifics of, of the number that was there. I, 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 what I heard was that it, while it was not a huge number, we were, I, I don't believe it was millions and millions and millions of, of, of euros or anything like that. I think it was uh, a, a modest, a modest amount plus the plus attorney fees, which are t traditionally not not modest. But that, that that's what I heard. Um, we we can find out more. But it, it, this was not a huge. As far as I understand, this was not a huge huge settlement. But it was it was the fact that there was a, a modest settlement settlement plus the, the legal fees that was kind of the, the important thing. We don't see a lot of the court cases where where there's this it, it actually bubbles up to that point where you have to actually take it to court. These things are usually handled before they get to court, so you don't even see you don't even see that on record. So thank thank you, Stacey, for that. Okay, um, and and. Um, Another question we see here is: Did Fantech, Versada, Ameriprise have an open source team or auditors? You know, I, I, I am, I am not familiar with the organization's, um, you know, open source review policies or practices. There, um, I, I would, in some ways, I'd be surprised if some of these organizations did, because otherwise they would have found these things before they went out the door. Um, that my, my experience is, is most organizations are not tracking to the extent that they should be doing. At this point, um, it, uh, I, I would say that you know somebody was on the ball when um, when Ameriprise got was working on this and they found this. I was very surprised to see this as a um, as a business to business term. And so who, whoever whoever did that that finding there, I think was really on the ball, and uh, maybe <laughs> deserves deserves a little credit there. Um, I don't know if that was a classic sort of audit team or just somebody who just um, was looking for any particular um, way to do a, a countersuit. Okay, next question that we see here. Let's see. 
Okay, I think that was what you put to me, Stacey. Any others that you have in your queue? Yeah, so just going through these here, uh, how risky is it to just wait until you get a warning letter to come into compliance? Oh. Well, I, you know, obviously, you know, being a, a person here at Palomita, I will, you know, I have a, a bit of a conflict here, so I would say, um, I would say in general, um, you don't want to wait. You, you don't want to do things on, on somebody else's terms, I, I think. In general, I, 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 this is not legal advice, but I would say in general, it's good not to wait for somebody to sue you or to threaten to sue you for you to kind of get your house in order. I, I think there's a lot of things that you can do starting today with education and, and quick, you know, quick searches with your developers. It's often a very eye-opening thing to talk to your developers and ask about the operating systems you're using, what third-party libraries you're using. Show me a list of your jar files. Show me a list of the RPM files. And as they start to pull this together, and you're likely you're going to see hundreds to thousands of items that have not popped across your desk, um, I, I think you'll probably see the extent of the, the, the potential issue there. I, I would never tell anybody just wait for a letter to come across. I think that's a ri very, very risky um, circumstance. Yep. Um, we'll also be posting this webinar in slides. Stacy's reminding me to say. So um, please, please do look on the palomita.com um, website. I believe we'll also receive an email as well after the session today uh, for that link. Any more questions, Stacy, before we uh, wrap it up for the day? I think that pretty much covers them. Okay. So uh, last chance if anybody would like to ask any questions. I'll give you, give you five more seconds here to type something over to Stacy. Um, but, but while that's happening, I do want to thank everyone again for joining us today. Uh, in general, I'd say the takeaways from this is that the more you know about what you're shipping, the better. Definitely start education and continue your education if you haven't done it already. And um, and I do think one of the, the big life lessons as well is if you do get a letter, a compliance letter, um, don't ignore it. Everybody who I've seen who've really gotten in trouble are the folks who kind of wished it away or have ignored it or have not been able to, to do the compliance for whatever reason, whether it's due to too long of a supply chain or not being able to actually get the material, things like that. So if you do get a letter that comes in the mail or is delivered to you personally, um, I would treat that extremely seriously. That is. Um, Pretty, pretty much a, a kind of a, a done deal when it comes to somebody paying attention to what, what you're shipping. We had a couple more questions come in here too. Sure, sure. So uh, the first one is: Is there clear agreement or maybe court rulings on how source code should be made available when your application slash device is using code under an open source license? For example, mm -hmm. in the media player situation, do you have to include a CD-ROM in the box? Is it sufficient to offer it for download on your website? So, so. Um, I don't believe the court has particularly said this is the way it has to be done. You know, very often we're talking about GPL compliance, so GPL2 or GPL3 compliance. Um, as, as I understand it, again, not legal advice, but I understand that GPL2 compliance um, really talks about distribution. Someone can come to you and request it on physical media. Like that, that, that is what the license says. Um, what I see from most, most organizations, if they put together a good portal, and they, they, they make sure that it is that everyone is it's clear and understood what code is being shipped. So if you have a device that has an about box or a legal box um, in the in the interface, that's usually seen as a good best practice, good disclosure of the licensing that's there, uh, real accurate licenses, good good listing of what's there, plus a good support portal that has the, the source bundle that you know, you know, by product or model number. I've seen the organizations who have done a great job with that don't seem to have letters coming in saying you didn't do the right thing with my compliance, you didn't do the right thing with my code. If it's, if it's clear to the users, the people who are receiving the product, that they've received open source, so you'll very often will see maybe a paper blow-in card with the GPL or the documentation, a legal or about box listing that, that scrolls on forever. Those are all really good signs. A good support list that, that allows the downloads, you know, especially if it's not hidden behind some sort of login. Again, really good, really good, you know, in my opinion, good compliance. Uh, I don't believe that the court has said it has to be this or has to be that. But um, the, the people who I've, I've seen you know, get in trouble, the people who have done no compliance, no disclosures, no blow-in cards. The, 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 the world is very full of companies like that. And I would say if you 
you have, if you've done some, some good beginning compliance, that may be a way of kind of showing that you're doing the right thing and not just be the simple target. If you are shipping a Linux device and you don't tell your users that you're shipping Linux and there's no GPL card, there's no support site, um, that's a, a pretty good target to say, um, hey, you're not doing the right thing around the community. So uh, one more here is, do you know of any companies that knew they were violating GPL or other open source licenses uh, and did go ahead and move forward? And, and keep shipping stuff? Um, I am sure that has happened. I'm sure it's happened. It's not a good thing. Um, I'm not aware of anybody personally who's, who's done that, but I, I think that they, um, you know, it happens. I, I would say that the, uh, perfect is the enemy of the good. I think pretty much every organization that's out there right now is shipping code that they probably are not in compliance with. So the sooner you can deal with it, the better. People typically stack rank these things just like they do with defects. There's a SEV1 bug, and there's a priority 1 bug, and there's a priority 5 bug. Um, people are definitely you know, kind of taking snowball approaches, you know, going from big rocks and smaller rocks and smaller rocks. Um, compliance, is, compliance is something that requires some work. Um, I would, I would you know, definitely, definitely caution people about um, shipping a known GPL violation. Okay. And, and I, did get a, I did get a one here, uh, which was, can Palomita audits and scans help with identifying image and sounds, et cetera? So I'll do a little product plug here. Um, yes, they can. Uh, we can identify images, icons, things like that. Um, it's, it's a big part of our service, as well as people using our software. I would also recommend, you know, not for the product plug, um, if you're working with your engineering team, have them, have them show you off some of the multimedia items that they're using. So ask specifically about fonts movies, sounds, um, CSS files. These are all things, you know, great if you use our product to do it, but there's also a lot that you can do just by with interviews um, and, and setting up your own program, you know, your own kind of compliance structure inside. Uh, but yes, we can definitely help with that. And I would also say you could even start this afternoon talking to your development team and asking them about these, these questions, fonts, images, icons. And with that, that, that's brought us to a couple minutes after 11 here. I know that people are going to need to start dropping off here. So I, again, I do thank you guys for joining us today. Really appreciate the, the hour. I know an hour is tough to take away sometimes. So do join us in about a month for um, our next webinar. I also know in two days we have a webinar um, in the UK, um, early morning for the US, but uh, um, in the UK regarding licensing. That's also on our website as well. If you'd like to join us in two days, for a, basically an open source audit oriented webinar, uh, just send us a note and we get you on the list as well. So thanks so much um, and uh, we will talk to you soon and we'll get this posted up within a, a few days and uh, send out the links. As always, talk to you in a month.